The key to losing weight is low insulin. Right. By optimizing our metabolic health, it is really the quickest way and the lowest hanging fruit way to achieve really almost any health goal. Recently, a study uh, was published that showed that 88% of Americans are in poor metabolic health. So how is that defined? What is that and why should we care? Right. Yeah, that study was fascinating. UNC two years ago, 88% of American adults have at least one biomarker of metabolic dysfunction. Because 75% of us are <laughs> overweight, which means a lot of the skinny people are also poor right. metabolic health, right? Exactly, exactly. And really, my belief is that by optimizing our metabolic health and really stabilizing, stabilizing our blood sugar levels and keeping them stable and healthy throughout our lifetime, it is really the quickest way and the lowest hanging fruit way to achieve really almost any health goal that you have, whether it's to look good, feel good, to have longevity, you know, to, to avoid chronic disease, to have athletic performance, to have your brain functioning properly. It's, it's really the, the trunk of the tree of so many of these, um, you know, pain points we're dealing with today. So, so what is metabolism? Fundamentally, metabolism is the way that we produce energy in the body. So we have 30 trillion cells in the body. And all Wait, before, of- Before you get in, yeah. I just want to come back a little bit, because I think it's really important to define this poor metabolic health. Yeah. It, it's, 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 there's really three biomarkers that are looked at, right? Yeah. And it was blood sugar, blood pressure, and cholesterol. Right, exactly. So. 88% of Americans have a problem with one or more of those. Yes. And the cause of all of those poor metabolic health markers is? Blood sugar dysregulation yes. and insulin resistance. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And so, so what happens is, you know, we, we have these 30 trillion cells and every single one, trillions, needs energy to function. And we need to convert food to energy, an energy form that we can use in our cells, namely ATP, for our cells to function. And when that process isn't going properly, the metabolism, when that conversion is not working properly, we don't produce energy properly in cells. And what happens when you don't have energy? You get cellular dysfunction. When you have cellular dysfunction, you get tissue dysfunction. Tissue dysfunction leads to organ dysfunction, and organ dysfunction is symptoms. That's what it is. And so this is why metabolic dysfunction underlies so many of these yeah. seemingly disparate symptoms we're dealing with today, so many of which you've talked about in so much of your work. But you know, metabolic dysfunction, this problem with producing energy in the body, is underlying some of the big heavy hitters, big killers in the US, obviously heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's dementia, cancer, chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, um, depression. depression, but yeah, all these other things that people don't even realize, <clears throat> depression, brain fog, infertility, <clears throat> erectile dysfunction, chronic pain, um, gout. There's, there's so many of these that we don't really relate um, when in fact, a lot of these are just this energy deficit, this problem creating energy and processing energy showing up in different cell types. But that core physiology is really the same. So what the one the main issue is is that our lifestyle and what we're eating and what we're doing and how we're living is hijacking that process that food to energy process by uh, one of the big big key players is the amount of sugar that we're eating in our diet um you know the average american these days eats 152 pounds mm. of refined sugar per year 100 200 years ago we were probably eating around one pound of refined sugar per year that's 152 times the amount of substrate that these poor little cells have to process. They break down. They just say no. And, and what that looks like is insulin resistance. Um, as I'm sure many of you listeners know, when we eat carbohydrates and sugar, the body releases insulin, a hormone, to help you take that sugar um, out of the bloodstream into the cells so that it can be used for these metabolic processes. But when that's happening in all the time, day after day, huge spikes in blood sugar, you know, the cells become resistant to this insulin. There's so much insulin being poured out. The cells are like, we cannot process all of this. This is too much. And the cells block it. So now you've got this issue where you've got tons of this glucose substrate. You've got all this insulin being poured out, trying to force more glucose into the cells. The whole, the whole machinery essentially um, gets, gets gummed up. And that's really the root of metabolic dysfunction. You've got poor energy production in the cells. So by day after day, like learning what is spiking our blood sugar yeah. <clears throat> and then learning how to optimize that, keep yeah. the blood sugar down, figure out what foods are affecting you, 
you essentially let the body rest a little bit. You know, if you can keep the glucose down um, day after day by learning what's affecting you, you can keep the insulin down. And then the yeah. cells start to perk up again to that yeah. signal and say, okay, we can do this. You know, this factory can run a little bit better. So that's what Levels is helping people do is really to learn how different foods and these products that we may be told are healthy are actually affecting our blood sugar. Um, with that information, it's the first time ever we've had a closed loop biofeedback system about what we're putting in our body and what it's actually doing to our health. And I believe that you know people should know what food is doing to their bodies. Right now, it's kind of a black box and it's a mystery and we have to trust yeah. food marketing. We have to trust the different nutritional ideologies. And you know, there's a lot of conflicting information out there. It's so a true. hugely confusing landscape. So and I true. really do feel that objective data, like through a wearable device that's giving you this real-time biofeedback, can just cut through yeah. a lot of that marketing, a lot of those loud voices, yes. a lot of the information from governing bodies that we know is not actually helping us achieve our yeah. goals. You can just see this works for me, this doesn't, yeah. and then improve your metabolism with that information. Yeah. I mean, here's, here's the thing, Casey, is that as doctors, we really don't learn about metabolism. We have nutritional biochemistry lessons when we study the Krebs cycle in first year medical school. And the joke among all the medical students is, you know, this is just a, a grunt class. Basically, you're going to forget it as soon as you're finished. Just cram for the exam and don't worry about it. Turns out it's probably the most important class in medical school. And, and we don't understand metabolism as doctors. Uh, and we don't understand even blood sugar and insulin yeah. resistance. You know, 90% of the cases of prediabetes, which affects about one out of every two Americans, are not diagnosed because yeah. doctors don't know how to diagnose them. And they'll say, oh, your blood sugar is normal on your test. Well, what is normal? What is optimal? They'll say, your, you know, your A1C is great. You're fine. No problem. You're, no problem. But after practicing this for decades, I have really learned that there are other ways to get the science of what's happening, which is sort of what you're really doing with levels is you're giving people the opportunity to measure in real time what happens when their body ingests food and how that affects their particular blood sugar. Because everybody eating exactly the same food might have very profoundly different responses to that food. I can, you know, drink a can of Coke and my blood sugar and insulin might go to X and Y, Somebody else might go to, you know, A, B, and A and B. And that and that's not something that you would inherently know. And the other thing that struck me was uh, that the the metrics um, th that we have are just really poor. And I, I think, you know, I was going to share a story of a patient which taught me so much about metabolic health. And this was a woman who had an enormous girth. I mean, she looked like the sort of Pillsbury Doughboy. She was just round around the middle, skinny arms and legs, just big circle around the middle. And clearly she was in poor metabolic health. Blood sugar was perfect. Mm. I measured her blood sugar. I said, well, maybe we should do a glucose tolerance test. Her A1C, which is the average blood sugar resistance, was perfect. Like that wasn't like, it was a hundred. It was like 80, you know, fasting, which is really optimal. Uh, and I said, let's do a glucose tolerance test and measure your blood sugar. And I'm, we're going to also measure insulin. Because most doctors, and this was this was probably 25 years ago, most doctors just never measure insulin, even today, 25 mm -hmm. years later. But it probably, as we were discussing earlier, probably one of the most important tests. So her blood sugar, after she took like the equivalent of two Coca-Colas, perfect, like never went over 110, even after drinking the equivalent of two Cokes. Her A1C was perfect. Her insulin, mm. on the other hand, like normal should be about five or less. Hers was over 50 fasting, mm. which should which is super high, it's 10 times. And when she she had the sugar drink, it went to 200 or 250, which you just almost never see. It should never go over 30 after a sugar drink. And I was like, wow, here's someone who, if she went to a regular doctor, would have a perfect test, even if they did a glucose tolerance mm. test. And so, you know, the the importance of really digging down to understand what's happening with your own body is so key. And that's what's so exciting to me about levels is it gives people real time access to data through a continuous glucose monitor, which is a really relatively non-invasive procedure where you track your your blood sugar on your phone, super easy and fun, and and gives you so much insight. And and like I, I was sharing a story before, I was I was uh, using the levels app and I was putting I had the device on my arm, and this friend of 
mine we're having a, a meal in Martha's Vineyard last summer and it was a, a farm to table meal but we got it brought in it was because it was COVID we didn't go out we had it like delivered and it was a huge amount of extremely healthy food and it was so delicious that we ate an enormous amount but even the idea that you could eat healthy and it still causes a problem if you overeat is not something that, you know most people really understand so you know, I can eat all this healthy stuff but actually our sugars, both of our sugars really, really spiked, even though we're both really metabolically healthy. So it's kind of a fascinating lesson in, gee, you know, we don't really always know what's going on inside our bodies until we start looking. I think that's absolutely right. And I think you bring up the great point about biochemical individuality when it comes to metabolic health and metabolism. What might affect you might affect me very, very differently. And I'd, mm. I'd wonder, you know, if you and your friend at this dinner might have had actually eaten the same thing and had different responses, you know? And and that is really an important piece. You know, there was a really fascinating paper that was published in the journal Cell about five years ago by the Weissman Institute, and it was called Personalized yes. Nutrition by Prediction of Glycemic Responses. This was based on the microbiome. Yes, yes. Yeah. They took 800 healthy people, so non-diabetic individuals, um, and they put continuous glucose monitors on them. These little devices that measure your glucose 24 hours a day in real time, send that information to your smartphone and they give them standardized meals. So they said like, you all are going to eat, you know, an identical meal or, you know, an identical cookie um, and see what happens. And based on what we know about like the glycemic index, which is this idea that each food has sort of a uh, inherent property of how much it will raise your, your blood sugar. They actually found something very different. Wait, wait, wait. So people, what she's talking about, what Casey's talking about is that, you know, scientists have come up with this chart of if you eat a banana, it'll raise your blood sugar this much. If you eat a apple, it'll do this much. If you eat chicken, it's going to do this, this much. And and what you're saying is that was all thrown out the window because it depended on what was going on in the microbiome. Right, exactly. They had some people who raised 10 points to a banana and others that, 10 glucose points, and others that went up 100 milligrams per deciliter. So wow. what might be a really sort of okay metabolic choice for you might not actually be uh, for me. Mm -hmm. And they actually found equal and opposite reactions between people. So person A could eat, have a huge spike to a banana and no spike to a cookie, and person B could actually have the exact opposite. So this is where I think testing can be really helpful because we sort of have this culture where there's loud voices in the nutrition space saying there's a one size fits all diet. But I do think there's probably some more nuance to that. So that gets into the kind of the nitty gritty of the, the biochemical individuality. Yeah, and like you said, in that study, the microbiome was a key determining factor yeah. of how people responded to those different foods differently, which yeah. was pretty fascinating. Yeah, so true. I had a patient once that taught me a lot also. I, I mean, most of the stuff I learned, I learned from my patients. Right. <laughs> you start looking at the biology and you start asking questions, start thinking. And, you know, most of us as doctors, honestly, just are pretty arrogant like we, we we got trained in this guild in which we were told that this is sacred knowledge that's true with a capital t that anybody who questions it is a heretic and is not quote evidence-based which is the sort of uh the way we crusade against people who have ideas different than us and we <laughs> and and you know we're you know we're basically uh you know often blind to the very things that are in front of us you know when a patient gets better or changes something pay attention so yeah. like this guy had this diabetic um you know regulation problem where his sugars are really volatile and brittle and and it was tough to control and we we did get dramatic improvements by changing his diet and putting him on a super low glycemic diet but it still wasn't great and he kept complaining about his gut so we started working on his gut and at one time he's like oh i'm just having all this gas and no no so why don't you just 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 to deal with your GI symptoms, just take some charcoal mm. as, a, as a sort of an emergent, you know, stopgap measure to help fix what was going on with him. And I, next time I talked to him, he's like, that was a miracle. I said, what do you mean? He says, my sugar dropped a hundred points when I took charcoal. Right. And I'm like, well, how did that happen? Right. It's not like the charcoal is not absorbing the sugar. What's happening is that in the, in the intestinal tract, he had a whole bunch of bad bugs mm -hmm. that were producing endotoxins, which are these really nasty toxins that certain bacteria produce called lipopolysaccharides. They get absorbed over the gut. They activate the immune system, the immune system. And this is just all technical stuff, but it activates these things called, uh, you know, cytokines, which then bind to receptors on the cell that cause insulin resistance. 
So basically these toxic bugs in his gut was causing his blood sugar to be all up and fixing that fixed his blood sugar. So it's very complicated. <laughs> I, I want to get into something with you that I think, you know, is really important for people to understand because we, we sort of touched on metabolic health and poor metabolic health. But I wonder if you can take us through the story of like, what actually are all the things that are happening? Because you create a list of, of conditions that are related to poor blood sugar. What is the biology of what's happening when your blood sugar is out of control? What happens to your microbiome, to your immune yeah. system, to your brain, to your hormones? Take us through what actually happens in the body when you are eating the average American diet. Yeah. So there's sort of four things that I think are, are kind of worth focusing on. There's, there's the direct effects of high blood sugar. So you eat something and your blood sugar spikes, and then there's biological effects of that. And then there is a fourth thing, which is the long-term stuff. So in terms of those short-term things, like you drink a Coke and your blood sugar goes up from 75 milligrams per deciliter, 150 milligrams per deciliter. That blood sugar spike can cause glycation. It can cause oxidative stress. Wait, wait, wait. What is glycation? <laughs> so glycation is the process where sugar just sticks to things in your body. It's actually just like sugar molecules sticking to things like fats and proteins and, and DNA, and that can cause dysfunction. It can cause those you know cellular um, parts sure. to be dysfunctional. And so that's that's an issue. We don't want that. It can generate inflammation immediately too. This huge surge of sugar is unusual for the body. Yeah. You know, it's like what what is going on? Why is why is this big change, this sort of homeostatic shift happening? Um, we don't want that. Um, and then it can cause oxidative stress, which is sort of this reaction where your body's producing um, metabolic byproducts that are reactive and can be damaging to the cells. So these right. unpaired electrons that go around and want to like bind rusting. with things. It's rusting, exactly. So big glucose spike, you can have immediate effects on oxidative stress, glycation, and inflammation. And then the fourth thing is this the thing that's happening both immediately, but also really has cumulative effects, which is the insulin surge. So when you yeah. have that big glucose spike, your pancreas is releasing all this insulin to help you soak up the glucose out of the bloodstream into the cells so it can be processed and bring the glucose back down. Mm -hmm. And what can happen there in the short term is that if you've got a big spike, so that big up and down, um, the insulin can actually sometimes overshoot. It can actually do too good a job in soaking up all that glucose. And you can have what's called reactive hypoglycemia, which colloquially is known as the post-meal crash. So if you've had lunch and then after lunch feel tired and you want to have that second cup of coffee at 1 p.m. and maybe you feel a little bit more anxious, that might just be the fact that your blood sugar has gone up, you've released all this insulin, the insulin's kind of overshot, you've crashed down, and now you're in this dip and the body's trying to get back into balance. And that that roller coaster with insulin- that creates insulin, a secondary cascade of hunger hormones cravings, and cravings. And exactly. And so that's happening in the short term. And then that insulin process, going back to what we were talking about before, can over time lead to that insulin resistance where the cells see that huge surge in insulin so frequently that they actually say, we can't keep doing this. You know, this is too much insulin and we get numb to it. And that's insulin resistance. And then what happens is your insulin levels, they start creeping up because your body's trying to overcompensate for that block by producing more. And then that leads to so many of the downstream um, conditions that, you know, we've been talking about. When you've got this high insulin, one of the secondary effects of that, um, let's just, we can talk about obesity. You know, Insulin is a signal to the body that glucose is around for energy. And it's also a signal to the body that because there's so much glucose around, we don't need to use fat for energy. Glucose and fat are the two main ways that we produce energy in the body. And when that insulin's high, it blocks us from tapping in to fat burning. It says to the body, nope, you don't need to tap into fat burning. We've got a bunch of glucose around. And so this is relevant to anyone who is trying to lose weight or who has the excess belly fat because that insulin is a real block on helping us achieve those goals. And so um, for us to tap into our copious fat stores in our body, we need the insulin to be lower. So by getting off that glucose roller coaster, by eating foods that keep us more flat and stable throughout the day, which is what we want for optimal health, both in the short term and the long term, we give our body a break from producing that insulin. And that can have a real significant impact on our ability to, um, to lose weight, to kind of get rid of that belly fat, to tap into this alternate uh, metabolic uh, fuel source and to generate what 
we call metabolic flexibility, which yeah. is this ability of the body to flip between using glucose when it's around and using fat when it's not around. And that state of being able to do both is a really healthy state. It's, it's adaptive, but the average American with the vast majority of our calories coming from ultra processed foods. And I believe more than 70% of processed foods in the U S have refined sugar in them. And we've been told, of course, to eat six small meals a day. You are on, as an American, this up and down glucose roller coaster all day. And so you're really never giving your body this time in a low insulin state. So you really do have to be quite aware and um, think differently. I mean, the reality is, as an American adult, you're on a treadmill towards being overweight and chronic disease. And unless you are doing something different, yeah. you will end up sick. And that's yeah. that's where having a little more awareness, well, I think, can be helpful. 100%. And all the things you mentioned earlier, people don't relate to this. They don't relate to blood sugar. They, they get diabetes is related to blood sugar. But what about cancer and Alzheimer's right. and depression and heart disease and so many other issues? Infertility, gout, you mentioned. Yeah. Sexual dysfunction. <laughs> yeah. Acne. I mean, yeah. just whatever. You, you know, it's... It's just unbelievable how much of our modern ailments and how many of those ailments are driven by this single process. Right. And you don't have to treat all these diseases separately. If you dealt with that, then these other things would get better. And I, I think it's a it's something that I don't know why, but it's just such a dark black hole in medicine. It's, it's there's a lot of literature on it. There's no lack of science, but in practice the average doctor doesn't know how to diagnose or treat insulin resistance. You know, one of my patients came to me and said, you know, my doctor, uh, I, I saw his blood sugar was like 115 or something. I'm like, hey, your fasting blood sugar is a little high. You're heading towards diabetes. He's like, yeah. I said, has your doctor recommended anything? And he's like, well, yeah. I said, what? He said, well, he said, wait till it gets to be higher and then he'll put me on medication. <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> Oh, okay. That is not a very enlightened understanding of how our bodies work. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the biological processes are so central to every age-related disease. You know, yeah. I, was at a, I was at a longevity conference once and I was walking with Leonard Guarte, who was from MIT and discovered sirtuins, which are these incredible mm. regulators of our mitochondrial function, our energy, which we were talking about earlier, and that are so important in, in longevity and aging. And I said, so what's the secret? Like, how do they work? And what's like, this was years ago. And I was like, this, the data was just starting to come out. He says, it's sugar. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, don't eat sugar. It's like, that's what's causing these systems to fail and for us to age and for all these chronic ailments. And and most people listening are probably, well, you know, I'm like, I'm not diabetic. I'm like, all right, what do I sh why should I worry about it? Well, if you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, if yeah. you have any belly fat, if you're even thin, but you eat a crappy diet, this is going on under the hood. Yeah. And, and so tell me why why you feel that, that continuous glucose monitoring, which is sort of part of this whole new movement of what we call biosensors or quantified self or, you know, portable metrics that we, you know, people have like scales that send their data up to the cloud or blood pressure cuffs or the aura ring or yeah. Fitbits or now there's continuous glucose monitors. Why, why are... Are these important and 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 why should the average person even care because if you're not diabetic or you know pre-diabetic which most people don't know by the way <laughs> that they're pre-diabetic because doctors don't diagnose it but why should people care yeah so i think that we've touched a little bit on why probably more people should care than you know they they maybe realize with 88 percent of american adults having metabolic dysfunction this is relevant to the vast vast majority of us but I really think it comes down to personal empowerment and really understanding our own bodies. You know, we're not going to fix healthcare without fixing health. And you can't fix health without fixing the decisions that we're making every day about mm, mm. what we're eating, how we're sleeping, how we're stressing, how we're moving, how we're supporting our microbiome, our, you know, all these things. And so it really comes down to choices. And right now, we don't have a lot of help to understand what choices to make for our own body. And that's where wearables and especially bio wearables, I think can be very, very helpful. Um, I'm not the type of person who wants to be strapped to technology for the rest of my life. That's not really like, it's not my goal to, you know, be a cyborg and be wearing a sensor, but, um, you know, I'd rather, I want to be unplugged in the, in the back country, right? Like camping. However, 
the reality is, is that the system that we're living in right now is designed to hurt us. It's designed to keep us um, sick. It's designed to keep us dependent and, you know, coming back, um, you know, for medications and surgeries and whatnot. So in the world we're living in where our taxpayer money is going towards subsidizing refined sugar and refined corn and wheat and disease causing foods, I think we need a little bit extra support. <laughs> and I think that wearables can really help with that. Yeah. Um, and so, so that's where, you know, where I'm really passionate about this is the um, empowering people to understand their own bodies and to make decisions for uh, themselves um, in the face of a healthcare system that isn't being really proactive mm -hmm. about metabolic health. Um, we, like you were mentioning with your patient, you know, those numbers, when we reach sort of the pre-diabetic or diabetic threshold, it's likely that we've probably had issues going on yeah, with okay. our insulin for 13 years, yeah. as, as one study from The Lancet showed that. Sure. 13 years before we get that diagnosis. So how can we as individuals have tools that can help us during this time? I mean, if you can keep your blood sugar in a stable and healthy range, throughout your lifetime, I'm fairly confident that you're never gonna walk into a doctor's office one year and get a huge bomb dropped on you, yeah. that you have a metabolic condition. If you're looking day after day, year after year, and knowing that what you're putting in your body is not causing these huge spikes, you have unlocked the door to essentially minimizing your risk drastically of all of the conditions that are killing Americans. And eight of the 10 leading causes of death in the US are directly related to blood sugar. Absolutely. And so, so that's- And then the cost and the suffering and the on and on and on. Right, and so I think having a tool in the face of the modern world that we're living in can be, can be great. And I, I also think that from what I've seen with my patients, when you really understand your body and understand how the environment is affecting your body, it's very motivating. Yeah. It, it, nutrition has kind of been a black box. It's always been an open loop system where you make a you make a choice and you actually don't really understand what the result is often for a long time. Maybe you eat healthy one day and then the next day you step on the scale. That's kind of a lagging indicator. How do you create a relationship between what specific food led to that result? Maybe it's six months from now, you get a blood sugar test or a cholesterol test, but that one-to-one -one relationship has been missing. Mm -hmm. And now it's not with these bio wearables. So for me, for instance, you know, I was eating oatmeal for breakfast. Oh, yeah. I mean, you just hadn't read my ultra metabolism book then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, you know, the box literally says heart healthy on it mm -hmm. and good source of whole grains and fiber. Mm -hmm. Um, I ate it with a continuous glucose monitor on and my blood sugar, and I'm talking plain oatmeal, zero sugar, zero fruit, zero juice, yeah. plain, plain, boring oatmeal. My glucose went up about 85 points. Oy, wow. For me, there is no chance that that food is heart healthy for me because glycemic variability, these ups and down swings like that. I mean, I never really want my glucose to go above 20 to 30 points above my pre meal levels. Right. This was like 80. 80. 80 so for me, it is not a health, heart healthy food. And anecdotally for most of our members at it's levels, not. it's also not a heart healthy not food. Really. We've seen very few people. And you know, if you look at the advertisements for this food, almost universally, it's the oatmeal with brown sugar, with fruit, with OJ, maybe with a piece of toast. I can't even yeah, imagine. So I think that's where terrifying. some of this technology can, um, can really help. And I think it honestly can also improve the relationship between the doctor and the patient. I think um, this is not like people going to Dr. Google and coming in with a bunch of you know theories and questions. This is real information. It's real objective data. And I think it kind of can equalize that playing field and that power dynamic between the doctor and the patient. Um, you know, the I think sometimes doctors will recommend things and patients will try them and it doesn't work. You know, their labs don't get better, they don't lose weight, and there can be a lot of frustration. There can be some mistrust. But if you can use a wearable to help personalize and almost be like a coach to help you achieve your goals, mm -hmm. um, that can really that can be great. And the reality is that 49% of Americans every year try to lose weight. So people are trying. And, and probably 75% should be. <laughs> right, right. But that's a huge, that's hundreds of millions of people who are trying, who are making the mental commitment to, I want to do the work. I want to do better. I want to try. 
and we don't have much to grasp Thanks onto so. to help us. And so I'm very passionate about how we can, for all these people who want to do better, give some tools, sort of a lifeline. Yeah. I mean, and here, here's the secret that most people don't understand, especially around weight, is that the key to losing weight is low insulin. Right. Not necessarily low blood sugar, but low insulin. Right. Because insulin locks the calories and the fat in your fat cells. Yeah. It's like a one-way turnstile. So once the glucose gets into your fat cells and your belly, it can't get out if the insulin's high, which people don't realize. And so the key really to weight loss is, is in addition to addressing all these chronic diseases, is to really get the insulin right. low. And, 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 and the tool of levels, which is just an amazing technology that helps people in real time track their blood sugar, correlated with what they're eating, with their activity, with their stress, with their exercise. It gives them a, a sort of a window into their biology that we really haven't had before. And we're, we're just gonna get better and better and better at it. Can I, can I ask you, Casey, tell me from the people who've used it, because now it's in beta, right? It's, yeah. it's not quite out and it will be soon. By the way, for people listening, uh, there's a closed beta happening now, but there's a wait list of over 120,000 people who wanna sign up. If you wanna skip the line, you came to the right place because all you have to do, because you listen to this podcast, is get early access through going to levels.link forward slash hymen. That's levels.link forward slash hymen to get to be part of the, the wait list top of the line. So you get to cut the line. <laughs> so so in, in all the people who've used it, tell me what are some of the cases that just were the most instructive, the things that you learned from people's experience. You mentioned a few things, I've mentioned a few things, yeah. but like give us some some real real patient stories. It has been so exciting to see what our members are learning by putting these continuous glucose monitors on and and using levels. Some of the most you know, fascinating things. I mean, there's a lot of low hanging fruit, right? It's like if you drink a soda, <laughs> your blood sugar often goes to the roof. Um, so that's that there are sort of the obvious ones. Um, but then there is sort of the not well, you know what's really interesting is it Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, I, I just remember the study in New England Journal um, years ago where they looked at, at first degree relatives of type 2 diabetics who were actually healthy. And when they did a challenge with them, they found that they had higher spikes of sugar and insulin than people who didn't have yeah. first degree relatives. So even if you look thin and great, you still might not be, you might be headed there, right? If you're not careful. If you're a Pima Indian, you know, even if you were living 100 years ago, if you had a can of Coke, you're going to be in trouble. Definitely. And that's how they got to be the second most obese population in the world after Samoans. Absolutely. Yeah. And But I think I think even those simple, like, learnings can be really helpful because we kind of know we shouldn't drink soda, although many, most Americans do. But, you know, you walk into the grocery store and it's everywhere yeah. and it's subsidized by our government. And, you, you know, you might get the impression like, oh, well, if it's subsidized by the government and it's covering Safeway, like it's probably okay. But then you see the data and you're like, oh wait, it's it's definitely not okay. Um, this is going you know way out of range. So, but then it gets into some of the more nuanced and exciting stuff. So mm. one big learning is people realizing that the importance of balancing their meals. And what I mean by mm -hmm. that is adding fat, protein, and fiber to their mm -hmm. carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So. People will, you know, eat, let's say, an apple all by itself and have like a pretty significant glucose spike. But they take that apple and they put some almond butter and some chia seeds on it, and they might have a very different response right. because we know that that additional fat, protein, and fiber from the chia seeds and the nut butter can actually, you know, slow, you know, the amount slow at the time uh, to absorb the glucose. And it can really change the dynamics. It also impacts the microbiome. Um, and so may even make us absorb less of the glucose because we are putting fiber in there. So that's been a major thing that we've seen is fat, protein, and fiber. Another- We call that the glycemic load. Right. Which is what is the total effect of the meal? Yeah. And even the timing, right? Have you learned about what happens when people eat what? Yeah, exactly. Um, the timing has been a huge thing. We've seen that people often find that if they eat something very late at night versus the exact same meal earlier in the day, they'll often have a larger response at mm -hmm. night and it can impact their sleep quite a bit. Even if it's the same meal. Exactly. Same meal. And 
Part of this is because we're a little bit more insulin resistant at night naturally. And this has to do with melatonin secretion. So to we help have us. dessert earlier in the day? <laughs> Basically, I, I mean, I would say that if people for are going to eat for dessert, lunch, breakfast. you know, <laughs> eat your, I, I do tend to now front load my carbs because of oh. what I, in the day, because of what I've learned from continuous glucose monitoring. And I also know that those ups and down, up and down swings called glycemic variability at night can really impact sleep. And we integrate our glucose data stream with sleep and activity tracking so you can start to make some of those higher level insights about how sleep and glucose um, are related. We've seen a lot of people comment on how when they get less sleep, their glucose is quite a bit more erratic the oh, next course, day. Yeah. It's a huge impact. Sleep massive, you know, exercise. sleep. And then of course, exercise. So one of the biggest takeaways is people realize that just getting up and walking for 15 minutes after a meal can have a significant effect on yeah. your post meal spikes. It can bring your glucose down faster. And if you look at a lot of traditional cultures, if getting up and taking dinner. a stroll, it's super common. And now we have the, you know, biometric data to, to back up why it's, it makes a big difference. So, and the last one, I think, that's been really interesting and again supported by the research is that stress definitely causes people's glucose spikes to be higher we've had people who are fasting you know it's first thing in the morning and they have to give a talk to com their company or they're on a podcast or something like that and they might get a glucose spike just from the stress alone and the mechanism of that is really interesting the cortisol and the you know, the, the, hor the catecholamine hormones that are released when we have stress, they tell our liver to actually dump glucose into the bloodstream. And evolutionarily, the purpose for this was because when we had a stress signal, like a threat, we thought, oh, we're probably gonna have to run from something. We're gonna have to run from the lion or whatnot. And so the body was like, okay, cool. You, you need to use your muscles. So we're gonna help you mobilize some glucose from the liver to feed the muscles. But now what we're dealing with are mostly these psychological stressors, an email, a honking horn, you know, a stressful phone call, whatnot. And so that glucose from the liver is not actually helping us. It's just no. sitting in the bloodstream causing problems. So what I'm loving seeing in our members is that this is not just about okay, put on a glucose monitor and eat low carb and get a flat glucose line. It's about having a holistic picture of your health and all these different lifestyle behaviors that feed into building yeah. a body that processes food effectively. Mm -hmm. And that includes the amount we sleep, how we're responding to stress, how we're moving throughout the day, of course, how we're pairing and timing foods. Um, and all together, those things can sort of work to let us have a, a better glucose response. Yeah, I mean, so. people don't know, like they have a glass of wine when they go to a restaurant at the beginning of the meal, it's very different than adding, adding it in at the middle of the meal. Yeah. Same glass, very different effect on your mm -hmm. body. So those kinds of things, or having bread, which they put at the table, <laughs> you know, obviously, is to spike your hunger, which yes. it does because it spikes your blood sugar. So if you have the bread in the middle of the meal, I mean, we shouldn't eat that much bread anyway, but you know, it's like, Basically, it is a very different thing. So how have you found that levels has helped people change behavior? Because at the end of the day, people want to change behavior so they can change the outcomes of their health. Weight loss, reversing diabetes, improving the way they feel, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's, it's twofold. I mean, one is that it's really helping people understand that you know, this is again, not just about eating the low carb bar that has no sugar. This is about really building a comprehensive lifestyle that supports our metabolic health um, and how to pull those different levers to, to do that. Um, whether it's moving more, you know, exercise for instance, the beautiful thing about muscle that I don't think most people or doctors know is that it can actually take up glucose without insulin. It's this glucose sink that soaks up glucose from your bloodstream without the insulin signal. Mm. So the more we can just like get up and move around the day, um, you know, even for two minutes walking here and there, uh, it, it contracts those muscle groups and helps you soak yeah. up that glucose yeah. get out of your bloodstream. So we've, we've really seen people, um, you know, learn about foods that are very surprising to them. A lot of people who have sort of been on diets and haven't had success and then realize that there are foods they thought that were health that, that were healthy that are actually not working for their body. Yeah. And some of the key ones, um, I'll use me as an example. I learned, I've been using this for now for about 18 months, but in the first month I realized corn, rice, grapes, sweet potatoes, oatmeal, and most grains all sent me above 150. So if we're I were, all told to eat whole grains. Right, but. and sweet potatoes and grapes. I mean, it's fruit and 
it's not to say those are unhealthy foods, but if I were trying to lose weight or if They'd I were be good for you, they wouldn't have been right mm. for me. So that's the type of behavior change um, we're really seeing. And, and I think athletes have been a fascinating one as well. A lot of athletes are eating the standard sort of recovery foods, whether it's a shake, a, a Gatorade or a sports bar and seeing that they're just going <laughs> to the moon, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, and that that's yeah. actually not supporting oh their goal with recovery. So, so that closed loop biofeedback, the ability to have, you know, awareness, control, sort of some agency. I think that's where we're really just seeing people um, feeling great. It's not just about the food. It's about feeling like we finally have something to hold on to, some form of control in what is a very complex uh, yeah. food ecosystem. Well, this is such a tremendous advance that, that now we have the technology at a relatively low cost to measure our blood sugar continuously. And it's just the beginning. I mean, Levels is going to be working on lots of other yeah. biomarkers that we need to measure, insulin, for example. And then we're going to be seeing this technology of biosensors, quantified self, wearables, becoming just part of the standard of care as a way of helping to understand what's happening in our bodies and giving us the ability to be proactive about it uh, and to be in charge. Uh, and, and, you know, um, my friend uh, Chris Carr uh, got cancer and she she decided she was going to, you know, take ownership of her own health because it was an incurable cancer. So she's mm. jokingly says she was the CEO of Save My Ass Technologies, you know, <laughs> Inc., you know, and I think that's sort of where we all need to be thinking because sadly our healthcare system is not a healthcare system, it's a sick care system. And if you want to create health, you have to learn how to do it outside of that system most of the time. And these companies like Levels and others that are helping people get the data that they don't traditionally get from their doctor is is going to just revolutionize healthcare. Just quickly, tell me how did you go from being a Stanford trained ENT surgeon, which by the way is no small task to get there requiring, you know, decades of study and a tough residency. How did you go, nah, I'm going to focus on functional medicine and blood sugar and start a company? It was an interesting path. So I'm nine years into my postgraduate training. So four years of medical school, five years of head and neck surgery residency. And I'm I'm sort of looking around me and I'm, I'm taking stock of what I'm doing every day with my life. And I realized that most of the conditions that I'm treating are inflammatory in nature. It's sinusitis, laryngitis, thyroiditis. It's all the itises, which as you know, Mark, itis is the suffix in inflammation in, in medicine that means inflammation. Yeah. And I'm realizing, huh, I'm prescribing a lot of steroids every week. I'm prescribing oral steroids, IV steroids, topical steroids, nasal steroids. These all turn down the immune system. And it got me thinking, you know, I'm doing a lot to really tamp down on the immune system, but you know, inflammation is the body's sign that there's a threat. It's perceiving there's a threat here. <laughs> that there, it needs to fight. We were never talking about what is that threat. No, right? That's so true. In medical school, we never learn how to be inflammologist or how to be detectives to figure out what the heck's causing the inflammation in the first place. We got very good at suppressing the inflammation with aspirin and non-steroidals and steroids and immune suppressants and on and on. We get better and better drugs with more and more side effects. But we don't really ever ask the simple question is why? Well, you can't code for chronic inflammation, you know, and so it's not something that we really think about. Do you want to know my secret for living a long and happy and healthy life? Well, all I have to do is check out my weekly newsletter, Mark's Picks, where I share my favorite tips for health, longevity, well-being, and lots more. Check it out and link below. You got me saying, what what is causing all this inflammation? What is the root cause? Mm. And what I really started to, you know, and, and, and why are we, you know, just turning to medication? And then when the medication doesn't work, going to surgery. And then it got me thinking, you know, you can't operate on the immune system. So really, we're operating on these sort of downstream effects of these diseases, but we're not actually changing the physiology that's leading to these diseases. And you're seeing a lot of recurrent revision surgeries. And it really gets you thinking, are we actually getting at the root cause here? And so that really led me um, on a journey and a journey to looking at those root causes. And what we know is that so much of the way we're living our lives these days in the Western world is what's triggering that inf inflammation. And 
one of the the key root causes is metabolic dysfunction. It's blood mm. sugar, it's insulin resistance. It's the way we're creating and processing energy in the body that can be a huge, when this is not going well, it can be a huge driver of inflammation in the body. And what I then sort of also realized was, okay, so ENT is kind of this niche part of the body, but all the other killers of Americans, the main killers of the Americans are also being caused by chronic inflammation, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, Alzheimer's, dementia, cancer, the same cytokines, the inflammatory molecules that are upregulated in sinusitis, it's the same ones yeah. in all these diseases. So let's talk about that. And let's talk about um, how to mitigate some of these root causes. And um, fundamentally, that comes down to um, not a pill, not a doctor's visit, not a surgery. It comes down to the choices that we're making every day about our exposures, about what we're eating, about how much sugar we're having, about how much sleep we're getting, the movement we're doing, the toxins we're exposing mm. ourselves to, how we're supporting our microbiome, our micronutrient status. These are the hundreds of micro decisions we make every single day. And so it became really imperative to me to think about how do I, if I'm a physician and my goal is to generate health, how do I actually empower people to make the decisions every day that are going to that are going to create conditions in the body that will ultimately lead to proper metabolic functioning, cellular biology, and ultimately um, health. And yeah. so that became a real shift for me from really being embedded in, into what is a highly reactive medical system that really uh, benefits off you know, people being sick and staying sick. That was another thing that really impacted me as a surgeon was realizing that I make money, I profit, if people who are sick come to me. I actually don't make money really as a surgeon if people are all healthy. And I don't think that type of that type of thought process really is affecting the average doctor day to day, but it's built into our system. And those systems factors mm -hmm. um, can be very troubling. And um, I guess, you know, long story short, it came down to a real reckoning for me uh, five years into my surgical training where I looked up and I said, we're spending 3.8 trillion dollars a year on healthcare costs mm, in the yeah. US. And the reality is that people are getting sicker, people are getting fatter, and people are getting more depressed. <laughs> this is not like much fun. <laughs> and we are increasing that spending year over year. And I am a steward of this system. I am a leader in the system. I'm a doctor. And if you're a doctor and you're looking at those realities, which are true, we're spending more and more every year and people are getting sicker, yeah, fatter, yeah. and more depressed. What are you doing if yeah. you're not stopping and saying, why? It's, it's just amazing to me that we never ask that question is, you know, why is our ship filling up with water? Yeah. Let's just keep bailing the boat. No, let's figure out where the holes are and fix them. Right. And in medicine, we don't do that. We were talking about, you know, your goal as a doctor is to, you know, create health for people. I would disagree with you. I don't I don't think that's what we're trained to do. We're trained to treat disease. We never yeah. took that course. I mean, maybe at Stanford they have a course in creating health 101. I surely didn't get that class in medical school. And it's it's really a very subtle distinction. But if you go to the average doctor and say, how do I create optimal health? How do I create profound metabolic well-being and health? How do I optimize my brain? They're like, I don't know, eat better, exercise, sleep. I don't know. <laughs> like, right. Take a multivitamin. There's really no depth of understanding of the science of health. And, and your company levels is really not looking at necessarily disease per se only, but it's actually helping people understand the subtle variations in their biology that determine the quality of their health which determines the quality of your life exactly right? and that is what's so profound about the shift of this empowering the average patient in our medical culture i mean the average uh, sort of traditional doctor was you go to the doctor they tell you what to do you just do it and there's no questioning and and the reverence for that is starting to slip for sure but there's still this sort of understanding that you know you go to the doctor to get fixed that's just not how it works the, the thing that I really wanted to, to to usher in and bring to the forefront, because it sounds the most like ghostly, it sounds like cast with a ghost, like it's not even a real thing, is inflammation and how inflammation has an impact on your body composition. And the data exists, it's just that a lot of folks don't know about it. And the way that it really manifests when we're talking about inflammation is that it has this very uh, detrimental impact on our organs that 
are related to our body's production and utilization of our fat, kind of fat loss related hormones. So namely, let's take our liver, for example. Your liver is incredibly important in regulating your metabolism. You know, mm. when we're talking about mm. a relationship with how it manages mm. insulin, even the production of fat mm. takes place in your liver too. The storing of glycogen can take place in your liver. You know, if your liver is, if your body's overburdened by glucose, your liver can literally convert that into fat right there on the spot. Mm -hmm. And so if something is damaging your liver, it's going to inherently damage your, your endocrine system and your process of metabolism. So inflammation, and I've just kind of shared some of the data in the book, um, damaging your liver. And what, this is one of the most fast growing issues in our country is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Yeah, and this is well, really a kind of chronically inflamed, in, inflamed situation taking place in our liver. And also, how do we how do we get fatty livers? Because I think people should know we we go to fancy restaurants and they give you foie gras, which is French for fatty liver. <laughs> and and uh, as, as how do they get the ducks to be like that? And how do they get us humans to have ninety million Americans with fatty liver? Everybody should know by now. Very simple. The fastest way to, to, to damage your liver and to create that fatty liver, when it, by the way, it's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because we associate it with alcohol, but sugar. Sugar, absolutely. Sugar, sugar starch, flour, it's, it's so bad. It's so bad, particularly your liver has to take on Your liver has to take on the brunt of it because your liver is really, even the name, live, er, live. Right. It's responsible for so much, like every minute, it's filtering your entire blood supply. You know, it's so important. That's right. But to take this one step further, and I'll just drop this little nugget so we can move on to the other topics, but also the master regulator, often referred to, of course, you know, I've even taught this in my conventional university setting, but your hypothalamus, mm. all right? Your hypothalamus is one of the major regulators and communicators with your thyroid, with your liver, with your adrenals, all the organs related to fat loss and fat storage, the governing kind of master gland, is called the master gland is your hypothalamus. That's and in your I've brain. Data, right. And now we've got data that it, this new term, neuroinflammation, yes. inflammation specifically regarding the function of your hypothalamus can damage what's happening with your metabolism. But nobody's talking about that in these cookie cutter diets that you need to address the inflammation in your brain in order for you to lose weight. Right. So Completely. these are all, and, and the beautiful part is it's possible. It's not just possible, it's probable when you have the right information. And we avoid the things that create the inflammation. And namely, you just mentioned sugar, but we go through a whole uh, subset of the different things. Yeah. So and in functional medicine, category. we also look at, you know, food sensitivities and environmental toxins and the yeah. microbiome and all. There's so many things that drive inflammation. And, and if you're overweight, you're inflamed. And for those listening, yeah. You know, think, oh, you know, I'm a few pounds overweight, a little extra belly fat, you know, maybe I need to lose 10, 20 pounds, or maybe you're over more overweight or obese. You should really pay attention to what Sean's saying, because right now during this COVID pandemic, what we're finding is those people who are overweight or obese or have even a little bit of extra fat are much more likely to get sick, more, more likely to end up in the hospital, the ICU, and to die from COVID-19 because of poor metabolic health. And what's so beautiful about the body is that you think, oh my God, I've taken years and years to get here. Within a couple of weeks, you can change all of that. You might not lose all the weight in a couple of weeks, but you can change your inflammation markers, your hormones, your brain chemistry, literally in a couple of weeks of changing your diet and following the principles that are in Eat Smarter, which is Sean's new book, which you should all get a copy of. Thank you, Mark. And just to reiterate, reiterate what you just said, it's so important. You know, the CDC's recent report found that about 90 folks 94% of the folks who lost their lives had an average of 2.6 chronic diseases or comorbidities, mm -hmm. you know, and we've got to get our citizens healthier. And the big thing in the beginning of this was, well, we can't get people healthier overnight. When, mm. when are we going to start? And truly it's up to us in conversations like this. So I just want to share that, but also leaning into this topic and just, you mentioned environmental toxins, but I'm, I'm going to share something that's a little bit controversial and right. this has to do with supplements because there's been a big shift taking place that um it went from about seven percent to 20 percent of hospitalizations related to liver damage are related to supplements because really? 
This is because like Mark, when I was trying to turn my health around, I became a natural pill popper first. I didn't get it with the food. And so I'm taking, I've got like my grandma's like pill <laughs> full of like 20, 30 different things yeah, that I'm trying to yeah, take to get these yeah. nutrients. in. so yeah. not to say that the right supplements aren't helpful, but it's a largely unregulated field on top of that. Yeah. But also we need to target and understand that your liver is responsible for metabolism of all these supplements. Mm. And it's mm. also responsible for drug metabolism. And now we've got about 70% of the United States population on pharmaceutical drugs right now. And your liver is responsible for that drug metabolism. So just want to throw those things out there. Um, but to shift gears, to go from inflammation, that's one of the ca major causative factors behind an inability to lose weight. And the other one is hormone dysfunction. Yeah. And your hormones a response, this is where the real magic happens. This is where the mm. show is going on. Your hormones mm. are like these little chemical messengers that are communicating with all the cells in your body and really create, communicating the message on what they need to do. And so there are hormones that are specifically related to fat storage and there are hormones specifically related to uh, fat utilization. Yeah. And just to give a super over overarching uh, look at this, insulin. Insulin is our body's major kind of energy storing hormone. It's a beautiful thing. Insulin is not a bad guy that is storing energy slash fat. It's, it's helpful. We need it. It's part of our evolution to yeah. have it. Now it's getting, it's being hyper utilized and, and, and put to work chronically and it can get mm -hmm. overworked and it can mm -hmm. just be like, I quit. You know? <laughs> so we've got insulin, but on the other side, insulin has a brother, glucagon. Glucagon yeah. really does the opposite. And they're both produced at, you know, from their loving mother, Miss Pancreas. And so yeah. they each have op opposing roles, but glucagon can't do its job unless insulin sits down. You know, the, these two things is a binary process, but insulin literally triggers the, the, the cell to open up to use that energy. Yeah. And there are specific nutrients involved in these communications and these pathways and nutrients that make these pathways kind of suppressed and create hormonal clogs. So a big mission with the book is taking folks through and teaching them about all of these fat loss and fat storage mm. related hormones to give them yeah. a really good education, but in a way that's fun and it makes sense. You know, we get a conversation about thyroid hormone, your adrenals, all those things. So mm. hormone dysfunction, regardless of what diet you're on, we have to find ways to optimize what's happening with your hormones. And then they play a huge role in regulating your metabolism, as you said, and they're driven in large part by what you eat, people don't understand their testosterone levels and your sex drive is controlled by what you eat if you're a guy. If you're a woman, your level of, of estrogen and, and fat is determined by what you're eating. Uh, certain foods increase estrogen, like sugar and alcohol. That's why they give estrogen to male steers to fatten them up, and marble their fat before they take them to market. Right. There's no there's no lack of science about this. We just don't understand. It. And then, of course, there's the appetite issue, which is such a big thing for people. Yeah. Oh, Mark. And this is so important. This goes back to when I mentioned Dr. Lulu Hunt Peters mm. impressing upon society that hunger is related to weight loss. And unfortunately. Millions of people still believe this and hunger is a bio, bio lot uh, like biofeedback. It's biological feedback that something is awry here. All right. And this could be a nutrient deficiency. This could be related to some form of like habitual, you know, addictions, things like that. But our hunger isn't the issue. We want to make sure that we're not hungry because that hunger is associated with overeating, of course. And we could try to battle mm -hmm. our biology, but eventually it's going to win out against our willpower, which is mm -hmm. finite. And so with that said, let's get folks educated on how our appetite works. And now these terms that we've been talking about, you and I, probably for over a decade at least, but now a lot of folks know about the power of leptin and the power of ghrelin. These are kind of the major players, but we go deeper than that. And now we know that leptin, for example, leptin is your body's major satiety hormone, and it's actually produced by your fat cells. Now mm. here's the catch. Folks, and this is one of the studies that I put into Eat Smarter as well, and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, found that folks who are overweight and obese actually have plenty of leptin. That yeah. should make them satisfied. Well, they have leptin resistance. Exactly. And exactly. inflammation causes leptin resistance. Exactly. It all starts to go together. They're still getting the DM. The leptin DM is being sent, but it's going to spam. 
You know, it's just yeah. like been too much. <laughs> Going to spam. I like and that. So, and so that's what creates that leptin resistance. Yeah. And that's just one aspect. And then ghrelin is this glorified hunger hormone. Mm-hmm. There are specific things we can do with our nutrition, obviously, that encourages leptin sensitivity and uh, really helps to get ghrelin in check. But there's so many other players. Adiponectin mm-hmm. is one that you're going to be hearing a lot more about uh, related to satiety. And adiponectin has been found to help to move more of the kind of troublesome body fat in the visceral fat area and actually transfer that to the subcutaneous fat area, which makes it a little bit more protective. We still want to uh, uh, address both of these kind of white adipose tissues, mm. but it, the visceral belly fat is what's really dangerous, the most yeah. dangerous from the data. Well, what's fascinating about adiponectin is that when you have high levels of adiponectin, you can't actually mobilize fat. <laughs> and, and, you know, what causes high levels of adiponectin is insulin resistance, which is prediabetes, which is eating too much sugar. So it all comes down to the starch and sugar. So your, your book is just filled with wisdom and information about these key mechanisms, about how different foods and nutrients affect your brain function, about the microbiome, how it affects relationships, how it impacts you know, our, our communities and stress levels. I mean, it's just, it's so full of beautiful things that are far beyond just what to eat. Uh, you talk about love languages in the book. It's just, it's such a fantastic book. And, and I just want to sort of close by talking about the, the research around sitting down for a meal with people you love and what that does to your health, your food choices, to your body composition, uh, because we've kind of lost that. I, I think, you know, the idea of a family dinner the idea of cooking together, eating together, being together. It's like, I think the average family has dinner together a couple of nights a week, usually all while eating different foods made from different factories, heated up in a microwave (laughs) that uh, are eaten while watching TV or being on their phone, not exactly conducive to health. So tell us about this, this research about eating together. Yeah. And this is, incredibly powerful because it's not just what we're eating, but it's also how we're eating and Mm. who we're eating with has Mm -hmm. a major impact on our overall health. Mm. And I share this story uh, in Eat Smarter that I grew up, it might sound a little far-fetched for some folks, just like people aren't sitting down to eat together. I can count on my hands how many times I sat down and ate a meal with my family growing up. Wow. All right. Wow. This was an incredibly rare occasion. This is usually, if it wasn't a holiday, by the way, Holiday is a little bit different, but it's usually just a free for all. We might eat at the same time, but we're mm. not eating together yeah. and or we're not we're eating in front of the television or playing a video game or something like that. And so this is not abnormal, by the way. Yeah. This is really shifting yeah. to be the norm. And mm. here's some of the healing factors of this. Uh, researchers at Harvard University uh, uncovered that folks who consistently eat dinner with their families frequently consume more fruits and vegetables and less processed foods and sodas. And one of the most, I think uh, this can get overlooked in the study. They, th- they found that folks who consistently eat dinner with their families also had higher intakes of some of the most important nutrients that regulate our fat storing hormones and your, your fat uh, burning hormones as well. So things like calcium, folate, B vitamins. Also, they found mm-hmm. they had a generally uh, higher, uh, lower intake of dangerous compounds, you know, like trans fats and yeah, yeah. and toxicants in our food. So this is re- really powerful. But one other study, and this is the most important for myself personally in this mission, and this was published in uh, the Journal of Nutrition, Education and Behavior. And they found very similar results. And now it gets into numbers. They found that folks who eat fa- with their family, and this could be any meal of the day, breakfast, lunch or dinner, just four times a week, yeah. had dramatically increased consumption of fruits and vegetables and reduced consumption of soda and chips. And what was Mm -hmm. so beautiful about this study is that this was done on folks who would be considered higher risk, which Mm. was uh, minority children, minority families. So this isn't just about fixing the, the, the environment around the thing. It's the personal responsibility as well, knowing you have leverage because the simple act of eating together as a family helps to increase, improve the health outcomes for the children and the adults as well. It, it's so true. My friend, Lori David, who who uh, is, was involved with the movie Fed Up that I was in years ago, 
Uh, I wrote a book called The Family Dinner, and you know she talks about the research on if you have family dinners where you're eating food together and you're making it together and you're enjoying real food, that the kids have less likely uh, less likely to have obesity, eating disorders, violence, do better in school, have less drug use. I mean, just so many benefits that you wouldn't even think. I mean, better grades. I mean, just right. by yeah. eating dinner together. So I think that's really important. And I, I think it's it's beautiful how you combine the the understanding of the deep science around food and how to optimize your metabolism with the science around relationships and love and connection. Uh, and that's really what, what food's about. It's about joy and pleasure and connection, but it's also about having us live our best lives because the, the tagline in the, in the, in, in, in the book title, transform your life actually is true. And food has the power to do that. And eating smarter will teach you how to do that. Hey YouTube, if you like this video, you're gonna love the next one. Click on it to check it out today. This is a central driver of almost all chronic Western diseases. Heart disease, yeah. cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, high blood pressure are caused by this phenomena of insulin resistance or too much insulin, which is 